Educational content makes up a huge slice of the YouTube pie. If you need to replace a door seal on a specific Whirlpool dishwasher, chances are there's a video showing you how to do it. Or maybe you want to learn about black holes or philosophy or the history of Irish folk dancing. Of course, you can learn things like how to clean your ceramic tile or how to build your own bandsaw. It's all there. This massive interest in educational content has caused the content to evolve over the years. And that's a little bit about of what we're going to be talking about today. But as I was preparing for this show, I got kind of overwhelmed with how broad of a topic that is, educational content. I thought it would be a good idea if we at least start out this conversation focusing on that subset of educational content that Chad and I produce, which is mostly how-to content. And I want to welcome back Matthias Wandel to the show to get his perspectives as someone who's also been at this for over a decade. Matthias, how, how would you describe your channel to somebody who doesn't know anything about it? Because it's not strictly a how-to channel. You do a lot of different things on there. I guess, you know, sort of woodworking entertainment. I mean, some there's there, there's various videos that are you know like the uh, the crazy blower thing that I built, which did really well, which clearly it's not uh, yeah yeah how to uh, how to make something dangerous and potentially hurt yourself. Um, so it's more about well just something crazy just to see what happens. Um, but yeah, so there's there's obviously a lot of how to type of thing which hopefully people find with search. And then there's other things that you know where it's always the hope that it goes viral or at least that it tweaks the uh, YouTube recommendation algorithm enough that it keeps getting suggested because it's fun to watch. So there's the how to and there's the fun to watch side of things. And then I, sometimes I do a little bit more into science type of things, but those things never do super well on my channel because I think it's just, I don't have the right kind of audience for that. Hmm. How much attention do you pay to what other people want you to do? Uh, well, I mean, there's what people suggest, but that doesn't necessarily mean that those are good <laughs> ideas. Um, what's a, what's a weird had, suggestion that you've gotten? Oh, there's always like, oh, could you, you know, like some kind of explore this obscure type of thing where my intuition says, no, this video would not do well. And I'm really not interested. So quite often it's like, well, that's an experiment for you to do. And tell me, do the experiments, tell me the results. I'm, you know, I'm curious enough to find out about the results, not curious enough to do a video that will not do well, you know, to spend many, many hours doing an experiment for a video that will not do well. How do you think educational content has just changed in general. Like we come from a time where um, content was being produced because all you had was the idea of what you were talking about in the video. And now it seems like it has a lot to do with production value and lighting and thumbnails and all of the rest. And we're getting away from actually being able to go to a YouTube video and just kind of like watch a project and like learn how to do a project. And now it's kind of a lot of aspirational uh, uh, aspirational do you is is there still good traditional educational how-to content out there on the platform today well i don't think there was i think there is probably at least as much as there was before it's just being swamped out by all the uh over the top type of stuff uh like it used to be you know like uh, steve ramsey's chessboard type of thing which mm -hmm. was more about how to but it wasn't really you know it wasn't being serious about out producing content for the sake of content. Um, so there's a lot of, yeah, like, you know, everybody's trying to do crazy, oh, it's gotta have this angle, you know, with epoxy, with river table, <laughs> uh, with this, you know, always add some kind of hook to it to try to get that uh, viewership because if you just make another video about making a coffee table, well, that will do about <laughs> as well as the other hundred videos about making a coffee table. Yeah, what's the, what's the deal with coffee tables? Why does every maker have to like be so obsessed with coffee tables? Why that that particular table? It's not an end table. It's not a dinner table. Like, oh, it's always a coffee is, table. There is, you know, it's to sort of, you, you know, coffee tables, a side table. You know, that's a very, it's like, it's these projects that are bite-sized. Yeah. You know, nobody's going to build their own kitchen. And so this coffee table or a side table is something you can do in a small workshop. It's not that intimidating. And it's something that gets a lot of attention. Right. You know, nobody's gonna, if you make cabinets for your laundry room, it's like, nobody's gonna look at that, but it's like, you know, got people coming, look at my nice coffee table. You know, it's an accent piece. So I think these uh, things people focus on 
are very popular and they're less intimidating that way. So it's, it's an ideal project for a hobby woodworker. As someone who's not a woodworker, can you please explain to me the fascination with lathes? <laughs> it seems like out of all of the videos that kind of captured the most amount of views, if you kind of like glue together a bunch of um, colored pencil crayons and spin it on your lathe and get a really good <laughs> thumbnail, you're, you're going to get 4 million views on your video. So uh, what is it about it? Like, is it just because it's like uh, satisfying to watch or is there something that I don't know about lathes? Yeah, it seems every video of Peter Brown's is put something in epoxy and spin it on the lathe. Um, I lathe videos themselves actually don't do like Carol Jacobson is, uh, yeah. and, and he's not been doing that well lately. It's like a lathe is sort of, it's not very fun to watch because it's all kind of the same, but it's, it can be very satisfying as you're sort of sculpting that shape with a chisel, but the whole put something crazy into epoxy and lathe it. That seems to be, I, I'm not fascinated with it. It beats me. Yeah, people people like to watch that, and there's just this whole fascination with epoxy projects in general. People just yeah. love. I think that it's kind of a fad, and I think it's going to start to. It'll give way to something else, I'm sure, because I, I think it's kind of starting to fade away. It's like there's, it's this. It's this year's this you know palette projects. <laughs> there's uh, the husband of a friend of of Rachel's. Um, he's been making some you know rick river coffee tables and trying to sell them for like a thousand dollars and people complained that it's too expensive but he's like i'm losing money at this because it's like yeah the way to make money with epoxy is to sell the epoxy not use the epoxy <laughs> <laughs> um so so you know you've got the you need this slab of hardwood you need a whole lot of epoxy which is expensive then he's got these brackets for uh for uh the legs and so you have like huge material costs and yeah, that's the sort, and it's the coffee tables because he doesn't have much of a shop. So he probably like hand planes these things and all that. Um, it's. I kind of get the impression that a lot of the, at least, and it's hard for me to speak about. That's why I kind of wanted to focus on how to and maker content rather than educational content in general. Cause I don't know anything about like, you know, the makeup channels or <laughs> that kind of educational <laughs> But it seems like, and it, it could be across all those different genres of YouTube, is that today it has to be bigger and more uh, expensive in the, in the maker space. You're definitely seeing people coming out with much bigger projects. They have much bigger shops. They have bigger productions. And it, it's like constantly ramping up the levels. It sort of reminds me, remember when prank videos yeah. <laughs> were the thing? And at first they were kind of, fun and and then they got to the point where it's like oh they're taking it to kind of a mean next level or something yeah it would be like fake bomb scares and and uh like yeah. uh, abducting children and whatnot yeah so it started getting into a dark place because it just tends to get more and more extreme to to rewind back to educational content i wanted to ask you what was the last thing that you searched on youtube education wise you didn't know how to do something and you went and you saw a vid and you're like, that was a good video. Do you remember the last time that that happened? Because I think that just happened to Steve. Steve was looking at getting uh, the uh, his YouTube yeah. channel recertified I'll, I'll or something hear, along those lines. Let's hear what, Mat have you, how about you, Matthias? And I'll get to mine. Well, I'm sort of thinking when the fridge started making a funny noise, I might've mentioned that in the last one. I, I should have reviewed the last one to see what I, I started making a bit of a rattling noise and I searched for that. And there was a video about, you know, like, ice build up in there. It's like, oh, okay, okay. Um, so I knew I knew it just needed a really thorough defrosting. Hmm. So I didn't even watch the whole video on that. It's just like, oh, okay, this needs, needs to thorough, you know, there's probably ice build up. So you just need to defrost it real good. And that's um, kind of a, that's kind of a whole uh, type of how to video is some of these you'll come across that may be eight or nine years old, but the information is still valid. And a lot of times, those are kind of the best ones. And it's somebody, it's like some guy who had a camera and he shot this thing on how he's fixing something. And it's not like he's a YouTuber. It's not like he cares about having, you know, more videos or anything, but it's just this one off video that has really good information. And I don't think that people so much do that anymore. 
It's funny because I can't think of a channel which actually specializes in really good how-to videos kind of on a broad scope like that. I find that the majority of the videos that I find when it's something like that, like you were saying, Matthias, it's like, oh, something's not working and or I need to change something or change a fuse or something like that. It's usually a video from someone who has either a hobby channel or a completely unrelated channel. They happen to come across this in their life and have like their fridge breakdown or something like that. And they make just a quick video. It's just super, I picked up this part and here's how to kind of install it or here's how to whatever. And it's usually that video that has like 16 million views on a channel, which has very few subscribers. And usually the other videos are, 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 uh, completely unrelated because I really don't think there's many people out there who are specializing, at least now, in just actual short, quick, practical how to kind of replace the instruction manual of, mm -hmm. of, of the internet. And that's what I look for, especially like if I'm looking for to learn how to do something in, in Photoshop or whatever, it's usually these one-off channels. It's a video from usually like seven years ago and it's just a person and a screenshot. And it's, there's no, Hey guys, how you doing? Smash that like button. Be sure to subscribe before even getting into the tip I'm being told to subscribe to the channel. So I think a lot of the, the older videos kind of fill that need and, and that just doesn't seem to be available much on the platform anymore. Well, I, the big YouTubers just wouldn't, you know, it's like, it's so niche that you're not going to get, uh, well, first of all, think of your million subscribers or whatever. It's like, they're not going to watch a video about this one obscure tip. Yes. And then you don't anticipate that this sort of thing will do really well. So the big YouTubers just don't do that sort of thing. It's, it's kind of funny because like, TV had to uh, appeal to the broadest audience. So even something like woodworking was already kind of off into the weeds for them. Right. And now, you know, like even the stuff that we do is too specific, but yet how to fix this one thing in your fridge or how to change, you know, how to change this particular relay in your car or something like that is already too specific for us. Um, so it's these people that literally do it like a hobby, like people used to. It's like, oh, this could be useful for other things. And maybe these people, you know, they'll be happy if this video gets, you know, a few thousand views. Right. Whereas for us, it's like, you know, so it, it, it's sort of, it's a spectrum, you know, it's like there's TV on one end and then there's the big YouTubers. Then there's YouTubers like us that are still relatively big and, you know, and then you get smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. And then there's the guys that just sort of make a video to share with their classmates. Yeah. I think that I experienced some of that when I tried this for a while, when I tried the home and garden channel, I thought, well, it'd be fun to have just a wide range of repair topics and gardening. And the problem there was that, well, one, it, I was trying to get other people involved in it and people really just wanted to watch me do it. And so that was kind of a problem. So I wasn't focused on doing all of that myself, but people want, it seems like to, if they want to learn how to do something, it's going to be that one particular thing. There's no reason for them to subscribe to a channel based on that. If, if I need to learn how to do, you know, how to replace a doorknob on you know my door or something. I'm probably just going to look it up, find it. And I don't care. I don't even know what the channel is. It doesn't matter. I'm just going to watch the one video and I'm out. And so it's hard. It would be really hard for a channel to just be like, I am your general fix it repair channel to really be a big channel because I don't see a reason to subscribe to it or, or to watch the videos on a regular basis, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So maybe that's where these, these one-off videos are, you know, it's such a good thing to have those on the platform, I guess. It's just a guy who just has a camera and shoots it, you know, and they're, they're usually like really dark and, and you got like the camera shaking and he's trying to set it up. The guy, <laughs> he's never done this before and you have to like really be careful, but I don't know. Sometimes it's also a matter of just trying to figure out if the information is even valid, but I think YouTube, the way it works kind of, vets the videos in a way by just likes and number of views and so when whatever your first response is on a on a search is usually going to be pretty close to a good video i think well i think it's like you know if you if you bounce off the video right away then they know and, and you're back on search well i because they have the metrics for youtube so they can see it's like did the person watch this video enough that maybe it answered them and I think search even used to be, I mean, before basically Google could see everything through various, you know, through Google analytics and whatnot. I mean, any, anytime you use Google anything, it's like they have access to that and they know that you've been there. Um, that, you know, if you clicked on a search thing and then you're back on the search right away, they knew it's like, well, that website probably sucked. <laughs> right. <laughs> 
you uh, had a video, um, I think you released it a couple of weeks ago. You talked about your dangerous leaf blower. I wanted to ask, do you think that video did so well because the first word in the title is dangerous? <laughs> do you think you appeal to people just because of the danger aspect of it? Uh, yeah, I guess it is a bit of a clickbaity sort of thing, isn't it? No one's, um, no one's looking for a leaf blower, Matthias. People yeah, are yeah, looking um, for danger. I, yeah. <laughs> and you served it up. <laughs> <laughs> Um, it's, do you, like, how do you, uh, how do you look at your channel right now? Like, what does your, what does your like strategy look like on your channel? Like, do you have a, a whiteboard with all of your ideas and you know what you're going to be shooting next week or do you still kind of have, have, have that casual list, hobby feel? I have a text file with a list of things in it, but, uh, I don't, you know, like quite often there's like that, that, that that fan thing that wasn't even uh, that wasn't on the list. It's just like, Oh, let me just do that. Just a real quickie. Um, so I do have a list of things that I'm thinking about covering if I run out of ideas, but a lot of times it's just, you know, whatever comes to mind is like, Oh, this is a cool idea. Let me just do that. Did you do a follow-up video to the fan video just because you, you realized that it kind of caught whatever. So you just wanted to keep going with that. Like you did the follow-up and then I, I think you were planning on either adding a cowling or something like that. And then it got destroyed. <laughs> No, I was, I was never going to add a cowling to it because that shape is really difficult. I was just pointing out how a cowling wouldn't actually help in the way that uh -huh. people would suggested. Um, and that was kind of, you know, and here I'm getting into the science again. And of course the video doesn't do as well um, because mm. I think science just reminds people of it's like, yeah, I should have, I, I should have paid attention in physics or science class in high school and I didn't. <laughs> and here's somebody talking about science and I suck at it. Ah, next. <laughs> I think that you have a science has to be approached in a certain way for it to be palatable on YouTube. Um, you know, I, I like Vsauce, even it's science, but it's not really science, at least back when he was, you know, making those videos, it was more about it's, you know, edutainment. He would pick an interesting topic and kind of tell you about it, but he, um, Michael Stevens, he did post a video. I want to say recently, it's probably a year ago, but he started bringing in a lot of math and numbers and I, I was just checking out. I was like, I, this is not, <laughs> this is not entertaining for me at all. And so I'm not really sure what, what happened there. It's a fine line between making it entertaining content. But I think once you start getting into some really difficult concepts and whatnot and some like uh, complicated words and all of the rest, I, I think, uh, I, I don't think that's an enjoyable kind of viewing experience. So you have to make it as entertaining as possible and as light lighthearted as possible. And that's, that's increasingly difficult with the dynamics of wind flow <laughs> through a fan or yeah. what, what you were talking about. I, I, too I, I thought I did that because there was no equations or anything like that. And I thought it was, you know, there was enough. Um, yeah, I guess there was enough paper dry diagrams and arrows on paper kind of thing, but I, I felt pretty good about that video. So I was hoping it would do better than it would. Um, but it, it, I wasn't too much invested in that video. So, yeah. um, then looking back at, you know, videos, other videos that have done lately, they've done fairly well in terms of ad revenue, it's just lead up to Christmas kind of thing. But if I look at videos from earlier from 2020, you know, it was less work than most of them and it did about as well on, on the views and revenue as a lot of them. So it was worth making in that regard. I but uh, you're saying it's not an enjoyable experience. It's not an enjoyable experience unless you kind of are into that sort of thing. True. So I quite like um, Ben Krasnov of uh, Applied Sciences' channel. Mm -hmm. uh, I quite like his videos, but they certainly are. And he puts a lot of effort into them. But they're way too technical for most people. And they don't do as well as something like Smarter Every Day, right. which doesn't uh, get that deeply into things. I think maybe that's the where YouTube, it has to be platform specific. And I don't think that deep dive educational content really is, a, um, YouTube's not the right platform for it. It's not even, not even educational deep diving in, you know, mathematical sense, but even just teaching something, even woodworking. I mean, that's why I have my courses are separate from YouTube because it's a long format. It's like every step I'm showing some of this is intended to show somebody exactly how to do this thing. And on YouTube, I would have to cut that totally differently and it, it wouldn't be that level of instruction. So you just have to kind of 
use the platform for what it is, you know, and, and, and kind of where it's at at a, any given point. We remember a time where you could kind of get away with like really long form random videos because that's essentially what YouTube was. It was that's what there was, yeah. whatever. Now it seems to be so much more curated as to it's, it's kind of in its own head where you need to be YouTube to be on the platform. And that kind of takes away from what we're talking about. Some of that old, those old, older videos where it was literally just about the nitty gritty and like not worrying so much about how this is going to come across is this whatever and just getting the information out there. So the question would be, if there's someone who's looking to start up an educational channel or a maker channel or something like that, what, what would your advice be to someone who wanted like, what is different right now? Well, question, is it really that different? Because I mean, think of, <clears throat> Think of 10 years ago. Um, so you'd put out a video and they got 10,000 views on how to make something and you'd be pretty happy with it. And those people that would appreciate that sort of video for the most part, I think they were already on YouTube. Now, 10 years later, those people might still be there but there's so much more flashy content. And there's so many people that want stuff that's a bit more like TV. So in terms of, you know, he's gonna get way fewer views than a makeup tutorial or something. Or, or something that is, you know, a little bit more, a little bit more like TV, mm. not quite like TV, but a little bit more broad based, doesn't get so specific into things. There'll be a larger audience for that. So if you still get 10,000 views compared to somebody else getting 100,000 views for something less in depth, you feel like you didn't do so well. Whereas 10 years ago, you got your 10,000 views and you'd be happy with it. Right. So, and then of course the audience, the people that are into that sort of thing, I think were early YouTube, early YouTube audience. Um, of course, their eyeballs are now being competed with with more flashy stuff. And just because they like the really technical stuff doesn't mean that they don't like some of the high production flashy stuff that somebody put a lot of money into, which means some of those guys are going to get distracted by, you know, more watch optimized, shall we say, videos. Right. Um, but it could be that, you know, even if you just took even if you had the same audience that you did back then, but no more, um, it just wouldn't feel like success anymore compared to how big everything, so many other things have gotten. Of course, there's lots of smaller channels, but of course, what do we all watch? The channels that everybody else watches, which are huge. <laughs> yeah. And so we compare ourselves to that. So a video that gets 10,000 views doesn't seem like successful anymore. Right. That's a good point. What, uh, what YouTube channels do you watch? Who are your favorite YouTube channels? Aside oh. from Clean My Space and Woodworking for Mere Mortals, and Chad and Steve have a <laughs> podcast. One of my favorite, like, undiscovered YouTubers is Matthias Berger. Um, he's a, I actually met him uh, years ago. Uh, other things, you know, I have to go through, look through my list of subscribers. I certainly like um, stuff made here. I oh, right. We mm -hmm. talked about mm -hmm. that last time you were on here. Yeah, that guy's yeah, still yeah. killing it. Um, still killing it. Way out west, uh, blow in blog. That's another relatively unpopular one. When he builds a machine, those, those, I mean, a lot of the videos are about other things, but when it, whenever he builds a machine, I find those super interesting. Uh, do you find most of the channels you watch are maker building channels, or do you, do you have other types of channels that you get caught into, you know? Well, let me just look at my subscriptions here. Let's see. Let's just look at what's uh, who's uploaded recently, um, because it, it's kind of hard, you know, sort of like what's your favorite type of thing. Right. Yeah. Um, there's Via Frey, who talks about politics, for instance. Um, Matt Cremona, I watch his videos. Just not so. I mean, they haven't been that much about woodworking lately. He's moving a shop recently. Right. Um, I enjoy, um, what is it? Uh, the blacksmith guy, um, gosh, not oh, the, yeah, I know you're talking about Alex Steele. Yeah. You know, so when he's making a sword, I couldn't care less about that, but when he's moving shop or like fixing some big machine, I find that interesting. Isn't so that interesting? When he's actually blacksmithing, which is what his channel is about, it's like, I, I don't care. I, uh, I was introduced to Frank Howarth at the time that he was building his shop. And I found his shop building videos just phenomenally uh, uh, entertaining. But I never really watched any of his like lathe or project videos simply because I was just so enamored by him setting up his shop and deciding where he was going to put his air blowers and stuff. Yeah, yeah. So, so then, one of the I things just, about producing content on, video, on YouTube is over the years, discovering the different types of audiences that I have, you know, there's people who tune in for all different reasons. And 
I can sort of predict who that audience is going to be. And there's some people who will like a certain type of video and are be very vocal about it. I love these videos. And then right next to it will be somebody who just can't stand that. Get back to making regular project videos. And <laughs> yeah. so it's always going to be a balance. And I'm sure you, you see that with your channel to some extent where you've got, you know, the hardcore woodworking and then you do like, you know, mouse experiment challenges, <laughs> things. Bob. Yeah, or... or are they you know exploring the uh airflow from the blower like there's like these are your best videos you're right and right there is an audience that really appreciates that it's just smaller right yeah i think it's the important thing is knowing that that's kind of the nature of how to channels and educational channels you're going to have various audiences within your audience and a lot of people will find your videos maybe based on those mouse experiments they thought this channel is so cool he does mouse experiments it's a channel all about mouse running through a maze and going through tiny holes and then all of a sudden in their subscription feed they start seeing you build a bandsaw <laughs> so you don't get those views so you got a separate audience for them and it's a tough you one you know there is remarkably little across uh cross pollination with that because the uh, my most most uh, was it the mouse hole experiment like that what that was getting like hundreds of thousands of views a day for a while yeah and so then I was looking at the metrics okay overall metrics of course were through the roof but let's subtract that out and see how my channel is doing and it was up maybe ten percent or something like that like it was totally not not feeding the rest of my channel. Hmm because that's the sort of viral sort of video where, you know, it gets suggested and people watch it, but you know, you, yeah. you know, you see some interesting video about somebody doing some amazing stunt or something that gets suggested and you watch it. Do you think about subscribing to that? No. no. Yeah. I've been and, to, to... Go ahead. And, and it's like, there's so much content that's sort of, this is getting into geeky sort of things, but like if you're traversing a tr tree data structure on a computer, you know, you can do depth first or breadth first. And so we're exploring breadth first at this point. It's not like, oh, there's one thing, let's see what's related, what's related to that. It's like, no, YouTube just served up 10 suggestions. Three of those are something that you might want to watch. And so you watch the first one and then you go back instead of saying, oh, is there more down that way? Well, no, 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 I've got to go back and watch these other two that I've also meant to watch. So that you're not inclined, you know, it's, it's and as such, because there's such a surplus of, interesting stuff for people to watch it's very hard to kind of get people to stick because they're already thinking about the other five things that that they're interested in watching yep. like they've already got five other things to watch on their mind so they're not looking for you to suggest more things to watch i wanted to ask you this last time you were on the podcast so i'll ask you now uh what is your um what's your protocol for doing thumbnails or choosing thumbnails uh, it's pretty random. Like there's quite a few of my videos where it's like, you know, the YouTube suggests three thumbnails. Like, oh, that's a good one. <laughs> that's better than what I had. How, I actually, I want to ask you that because I've been relying upon those three more and more recently. And I realized that they're not as random as they, or I sometimes get inspired by that and then try to find something similar and then gussy it up or whatnot. Do you, do you find yourself using them more and more now? Or they're, they're certainly biased towards looking at the camera. Like it, yeah, it tends yeah to they seem to really like faces as close as yeah. possible obviously smile or like some kind of strange hand motion usually also seems to yeah capture yeah them. and of course at the time that you're looking at those they haven't actually they don't have any metrics on views of the video yet which you know if they had those they could pick figure out which where people found it interesting um so usually a lot of my videos have an article to go with it and so i will have picked out like 20 to 50 photos to go with the article and so usually what i do if I have an article to go with it, I'll scroll through the, I'll scroll through my article to see if one of those, you know, cause I've already kind of picked out key scenes from that. It's like, oh, this might be a good one. And so actually the video just released this morning. Uh, I was going through, it's like, oh, this is actually a pretty good one, but it's too bad my head is partially cut off. And I'm like, looking at it right now. <laughs> yeah. So then I'm kind of like, oh, wait, wait, wait. The bandsaw is in exactly the state, it's almost in the same state as it was in that video. And one of my philosophies, like, don't take, don't tidy up until the video is edited or, you know, like don't take down the set until you've edited. Um, so that, because sometimes I have to end up going back in the shop and filming some key other bit. Um, so I was like, okay, let's just fake it. Well, you know, so I set, I set the camera and 
held a bandsaw wheel in there, no intention of actually putting it on there. <laughs> so the shot was of me actually putting it on there, but my face was like, you could only see, it was cut off like maybe right about here. So you could yeah. barely see my cheeks and my nose and my mouth. Um, so it's like, let's just, and it, it took me like 10 takes to uh, get the framing just right. And, <laughs> and, you know, like, cause, cause I can't really see myself while I'm doing this. Like right. okay, a little bit further back, a little bit different angle um so and i think that thumbnail is really helping that video it's doing oh it is relatively well considering the topic well you know i've done i do the same thing with kind of like faking scenes once in a while for a thumbnail but instead of and i don't know if this is what you did but i don't actually ch take a still i just shoot video but i just kind of hold myself still so that i can get a nice screen cap from oh yeah that, that was video too I, I i shot video there because if you yeah if you set the timer then that adds an extra level of nervousness yeah and then you're running back and forth and it's just <laughs> yeah it's just uh, <laughs> it's not a good but you know some of your thumbnails are like you inside of the router table <laughs> yeah like, that was a great one actually yeah finishing up the really? router table you're like crawled inside of it and but i think that the like the mouse ones are are brilliant really because they show such an action and i, I don't it, it's been a while i can't find it right now but the one where the mouse was squeezing through the hole it had so much drama oh yeah because the mouse kind of, yeah yeah at that, at that point the mouse was actually trying to pry itself back out so it's using its hind legs to pull itself out right you can't help but click on that video you're like oh my god this little mouse i gotta see if he makes it through the hole oh and by the way i needed to watch the video several times because i just love the sound effect that you put oh, the, the sound mouse effects popping great. through oh, and, popping like, and, try, and trying to squeeze it, through the hole some people find it disgusting <laughs> There's quite a lot of comments about that, about like that is disgusting. <laughs> the sound effects. <laughs> Those are great. Yeah, you must have had a blast making that video, huh? Yeah, you know what inspired me to do the sound effects that way? This is like back in the '80s. I was just playing around, so we had cats, and I had noticed, like, just if you sort of pull air between your teeth, like that, that seems to cats seem to find oh, that yeah. noise intriguing. And I'd recorded that on a reel to reel tape deck and i was just kind of rewinding it with my finger but it was on play so i was playing it like three four times the actual speed and suddenly the cat came charging into the room and sat in front of the speaker and i'm like whoa <laughs> <laughs> it works do you see much of your content as when you're creating it do you want it to be you know evergreen content content that's actually search searchable yeah, the, the problem is at this point, if you create evergreen content to be evergreen, it doesn't work anymore. Hmm. So uh, because it doesn't do well with a regular audience, then YouTube decides it's a sucky video and ranks it lower and doesn't suggest it when you search. So I think I, I don't target evergreen anymore because if you target evergreen, it doesn't work as evergreen. So I, you know, now I target more entertaining for the audience that I've got. And some of these videos become evergreen but only if they succeed with a regular audience. Right, right. Yeah, I kind of I kind of came across that conclusion also with the like seasonal um, videos, you know, because YouTube is really big on saying do tent, they call them tent pole videos where it's centered around, you know, Christmas or make a Halloween. Well, I do the Halloween videos, but, you know, they're centered around some sort of a date. But what happens is it, then after that date, it's, useless for an entire year until that date yeah. comes around and then it's it's i don't think it's as searchable as somebody who's posting something new about that holiday yeah aside from, well, it, aside from if you're mariah carey and every year they play your christmas song <laughs> and you make 10 million dollars every single year but you're absolutely right because uh we we did uh we did a super bowl party cleanup video many years ago and we had associate like we launched it the day after super bowl thinking that a bunch of people and people just aren't interested it's strange how uh, an idea which sounds really good in your head sometimes just doesn't come to fruition well and i think if somebody needs help for cleaning up after super bowl they're probably not going to think of searching for cleaning up after super bowl but like because that's getting rather specific i just want to clean right <laughs> they're too busy cleaning up the vomit <laughs> Just yeah, search, search YouTube for, how to clean for up a vomit. video. I don't know, but not how to clean up vomit after Super Bowl. <laughs> <laughs> so there's the title of your video right there, Chad. Clean I'm gonna go and change vomit. it right now. How, how many how many videos do you have on cleaning up vomit? Oh, if there was one, <laughs> I, I mean, I, I'm not into these seasonal sort of things, but there's a yeah. certain seasonality. So this time of year, building shelves is very popular. 
Yeah, uh, definitely. And actually, I find that in January, I tend to lean towards organization stuff. People just always want to get, kind of get organized. It's, you know, it's the whole new yes. year. New, I want a fresh new start. And shop projects tend to do really well in January. I think and dare I say of- that's not even that doesn't even classify as temple as far as I'm concerned. I don't think New yeah. Year's is like it's like there's just a, a huge shift in our psyche, which I mean, our videos go through the roof. Yoga videos go through anything which is obviously associated. The yoga with, like, videos are hilarious, though, to watch the graph of how they go down. Through day the one, 500,000 views. Day two, 100,000 views. <laughs> day three, 400 views. Yeah. Any kind of workout <laughs> video in January, you know, it's like 30 days to a flatter stomach. And then by, you know, day 10 they're down to no views at all people are like yeah okay i'm done have you dug into anything on your youtube channel or like really gotten behind something that excited you but then just was a complete flop and 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 it, it you, you just had to call it most sort of sciencey videos <laughs> oh okay, <laughs> Again, like, i really enjoyed the deep dive type of thing and i wish there it's just if everybody was like me these videos would do well but like this is sort of where i am poorly aligned with my audience <laughs> What you should the- get that printed on a shirt. If, if people were more like me, these videos would do well. Yeah, yeah. wear that. <laughs> I, I've been meaning to ask you also about your second channel, your just random stuff, you call it. And But you have woodworking on there and you'll talk about some. And I'm always wondering, why don't you just put that on your main channel okay it seems like perfectly appropriate it's not outside it's not like you're reviewing movies or something like that so i mean it would fit with your regular content and it would i don't know i'm just wondering yeah why you do and i've been kind of this sort of stuff that's a little bit too niche and since i don't put as much on the main channel these days just you know not as much time to make videos i should put I, i'm kind of like yeah I just put it on the main channel instead but and there's been a few videos on the second channel that really should have been on the main channel yeah um, like fixing the rocking chair, which I just thought was just a little bit, you know, it wasn't, it's like, well, I'm fixing this rocking chair. Might as well make a video about it, but it's too niche, but it actually, it did fairly well. And that should have been on the main channel. Um, so it's kind of, yeah, hit and miss type of thing. And the, uh, the one, the second video about the leaf blower was originally just for the second channel, but I'm like, you know, this could do really well. Cause actually I really enjoyed making that one. It had a bit of that sort of excitement to it. But of course, it's cursed by the science. <laughs> um, YouTube so, would like it. YouTube would like it if you put all of that, I'll bet, over on your main channel. Because I, some of my most surprising videos are videos that were just total throwaway. I didn't think anything of them. And then people watch them. You, it's really hard to tell. I mean, as long as it's kind of consistent and you're still doing your stuff. Um, yeah. Seems do you uh, do, do you uh, do you get a little lift when you hit the publish button? Do you do you think about um, uh, uh, the, the video and how it will be received? Do you just put it out there, and once it's out there, you are on. Oh to the yeah, next I thing. think about that, and then you know the first day. I mean, it's not as I'm not as excited about it as, as I used to be, but it's like I will check uh, quite a few times how the comments are doing after a video is published. Do you have a do you have a metric that you are like oh it's done this so therefore I know it's going to be an okay video. It seems like all creators kind of have like a little thing it's like hey so long as it gets you know x amount of you know likes or something like that within a certain amount of time that okay this this will probably be a good video. Do you have anything like that? Yeah, like how it does in the first hour so I used to uh look on the real time. I mean, they, they've changed analytics and now it kind of shows what the zone of your most recent videos have done. So it already sort of shows it you there. I used to, it's like, okay, you know, it's like, does it get like, does it get 14,000 views in the first full hour type of thing? Yeah. Least, so I don't get that anymore. Um, so that- Unless you're going, doing something dangerous. No, even then, even then. But of course also just, you know, YouTube's algorithms keeps changing too. So um i you know where how is you know how is you how much is newness a factor in terms of recommendation algorithm you know so that may change over time that they decide you know after so many hours the video is just a regular video like how much how much uh, benefit does the video get from being new for getting suggested and of course whatever formula they use for that will dramatically change what sort of initial uh, hit you're going to get yeah. Um, then, yeah, for me also, it's like, how does it do after a few days? Because that's when, you know, there's, of course, the initial appeal of um, 
you know, you know the, the, that initial the first Your first wave of subscribers clearly the first hour click is through just, and watch subscribers and... in the thumbnail kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And then after a few days, that can, tells you how well a video does long term. Like, is it one of those videos that's going to stick around? Um, so the leaf blower video has been doing fairly well. And I used to, you know, at least uh, one in 10 videos would be one of those that continue to get a thousand views a day, like for months on end. And that mm -hmm. is not the case anymore, which partially algorithm changes and partially just so much more stuff to watch. They've really seemed to take the focus off of the freshness. We've, we've, I've noticed, uh, uh, like in and around day seven to day 10 is when we start to get, I think what you're alluding to that kind of that secondary push, or I, I don't, th I think they give a little bit more time for a video to kind of ruminate within the organic audience that it's intended for to see how like the, your direct subscribers, the people who are going to be first to kind of see it. Uh, accept it and then maybe give a few more days to kind of let it air out and see what it does in more of the traditional platform and, and in trending and then it seems and again this is just our experience uh, in and around day seven day day nine there's this huge threat that seems to be kind of when the 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 recommendation engine kind of kicks in and then they they really start that's when we really start seeing some traction on the stuff that sits well and it's that it, like it's not that first 24 hours anymore mm. but it's still clearly important i still go out and share on twitter share on instagram get as many eyes as it uh, on it as possible but they certainly have seemed to kind of like turn the knob down a little bit well on i think that first day being so you're important. probably unusual that way steve i imagine your videos don't like the that surge after a week or so, I, I don't see that. And I imagine, Steve, you don't see that so much either. That it's no, not, not anymore. Not since I'm kind of doing more, you know, vlog videos, people, it's just a matter of just kind of seeing it and keep up with it. And, you know, hopefully people will jump in, but I haven't, I don't see that. that That's true. Cause you, yeah, you've certainly moved towards more of a, an adaptive video, kind of like a video doesn't need to kind of fit into a certain, but we're still clearly in well, that space of video. like where we're, we are evergreen content and as as much as people know melissa and, and our brand and all of the rest we're we're dishing out cleaning tips so yeah we do have to be mindful of that people people, people don't sit like around and tips. share cleaning videos because they're so fun to watch so it's more of a, <laughs> right you'll find it because they're looking for something right and the nuance this, of Melissa's backstory of cleaning something isn't as interesting as your backstory of you know uh, figuring out how to like you know do whatever you're doing so yeah i, I do understand that because I'll, I'll watch a matthias wandel video even if i'm not interested in the topic because i know you're going to make it interesting and it's fun it is always fun to watch and i i get sucked into them sometimes i'll think well, i'm not sure if i'm that interested but every time you know you're like repairing some silly little thing i don't know, even know what it was you i, I want to fix this and here you pull out some old pieces of wood and you make it work and i just think that's really really fascinating Exactly. I'm, uh, I'm also now fully addicted to your videos too. And I, d I have a, a unrelated, but related side question. Are you planning on selling your house with the bandsaw in it? Or are you just yeah, at some point going to pull that bandsaw out? <laughs> We're not planning on moving. We, we have no plans on moving for the foreseeable future. <laughs> um, but uh, no, it'll, uh, my, my 20 inch bandsaw, actually, I, the house we were living in, I carried that myself out of the basement. Oh. Uh, like a couple of times kind of thing uh so i took the wheels off of it because those are relatively heavy and the motor off of it and then i just kind of put my shoulder like put it on my shoulder where the the c opening is i put that over my shoulder and <laughs> carried it up the steps uh, I love watching your videos for that reason. I love watching your videos because of the audience you have. And that question was kind of asked because that seemed to be the thing that was really a, a, a hot topic in, uh, in the uh, comments yeah, section just, was how you're possibly going to get that. Like it matters. I shouldn't have mentioned the door again, but it's just kind of like yeah. to point out that it's, it's a bit big. It's like, no, it doesn't really matter whether it fits through that particular door, but everybody seems to suggest how I could fit it through that door. Isn't it, it, you know, one of the things that can happen when you post a YouTube video, and I actually removed a video 
just a couple of weeks ago that I posted. It's the first time ever in 12 years of making a video that I deleted a video a couple hours after I posted it because people were fixated on one thing. And once that happens, your comment section just gets flooded with everybody just like wanting to this. And it's like, you didn't even see the rest of the video. You, you're so focused. And in this case, it was just because of this. And it was just a nothing video. I was repairing a cabinet and I thought it was a funny story because it was a stupid story on my part that this cabinet oh, fell off. Oh, I watched off. that, yeah. You saw it. So you were there at the early and and it was just a dumb video. And people were like fixated on like, why didn't you build this yourself? How could you pay that much? It was a custom cabinet. My, you know, we had it made for this new bathroom. It fits in there and it fell off the truck. And I thought, oh, this is the dumbest thing I've ever done, but I'm going to fix this thing. And it was not that hard of a repair, but oh man. And it just it became overwhelming. And I thought, you know, this isn't worth it. I'm not going to try to answer these comments. So I just deleted the video. It, well, was, it was kind of, it was frustrating. And it was also one of those things where I thought I should have known that after 12 years of doing this, I still, <laughs> just when I think I know every little thing that people are going to pick up on, I should have known that they would have picked up on that. And Well, I've, you could, uh, I've got videos like that, like my, uh, floor we finished by trial and error like it was clear by the end you know by the time i was done it's like okay i finished the floor but there's clearly easier ways of doing this and that and, and i made that clear at the end of the video but the number of hostile comments i get that way yeah um so it's like yeah if you know for if, if you if you just have a small room that's like 100 square feet that might still be worth doing it this way even though it's more work because it's not worth renting a sander for um and I was just kind of like the video does very well on the ad revenue part. So I put up with it um, and I haven't yeah. disabled comments. I just kind of ignore them and there isn't, it's too hard to, uh, there isn't any kind of keyword that keeps coming up. Like with my most video at some point, there's a spider that crawls across the screen. Yeah. And I thought that was kind of neat. So I left that part in because yeah. the moment that triggered that I had the motion sensitivity really high. So the spider, the spider crawling across the frame triggered the motion and it recorded. I was like, oh, you know, like there's a little bit. And everybody's like, did you notice the spider? Yeah. So now one of my block words is spider. But yeah. I still see that sometimes, sometimes people misspell spider. <laughs> <laughs> and it comes through, right. Do you have a long list of block words on your channel? Yeah, quite a long list. I mean, obviously the Ted's woodworking yeah. like scams. Yeah. Uh, which seemed to morph by name from time it's, to time. Isn't that weird how it, it changes into all these different forms and names? And it's a, it's the most bizarre thing ever. This whole Ted's woodworking. Well, when you negative, when your reputation is negative, mm -hmm. when your reputation is a liability, it's best to keep changing the keywords so that you walk away from that. Yeah, I can't believe people still still fall for this thing, but I guess they do. <laughs> When you were on the podcast last time, some people left. I mean, we had like a hundred comments on the video. Um, yeah, thank because... you for, for that too, because that actually put us over the thousand subscribers. Yes, <laughs> yes having, we, having you we managed to unlock some features <laughs> thanks to you being on the podcast and actually for you putting a video together on your second channel and all the rest. There were just a couple of uh, comments that I just wanted to go go over with you. And uh, the first one is, is actually in line with what we were talking about earlier. And it was from David Smith. He says, I've been subscribed to both Steve and Matthias since the early days. I bought plans and made some mostly picked up tips and tricks. I was never going to build a full project, but prefer the tips. Uh, I've been thinking a lot about why I prefer Matthias's videos. I feel like I'm, uh, I feel like I'm observing one guy and his hobby. I love that about Steve's early videos. Old Steve. As old we Steve to it. was better. That's old Steve. Because old Steve was way better. Than I miss so old him. Steve. I loved old Steve better. Uh, once felt like it was, uh, when it's not a guy uh, feeling like it's a guy doing his job, it, was, it simply isn't appealing. Uh, although I love the lockdown series. Either way, uh, again, just kind of echoing the point, and a few people said this, that they just prefer you know, person in their shop doing their thing because it's a hobby and they happen to be recording it just because it does not come across as, hey, buy my thing, follow me here, subscribe to my channel and whatnot. So I thought that was kind of interesting. Well, those the comments are nice like that, but if you're really wanting to start a channel, you wouldn't do that. <laughs> if you wanted numbers, if you're looking for sheer numbers, I think the vast audiences don't really respond as much to that as they do at least today, to these really polished productions. Yeah, agreed. 
but Robert, I, I, I do, I, I, you know, old Steve is better than new Steve. I, I, I like, not that I've watched all of your videos recently, but like the one about the cabinet broke, I, I quite enjoyed that one much more so than some of your more polished, like you got yeah. real polished um, leading up to uh, before you started doing the courses. Yeah. And it was, and I think I've mentioned, might have mentioned that in the previous podcast that I was visiting John Heist and I was like, you know, a low point Steve reached when, when he did the toothpick holder. Oh, that's an old one. And so I popped that one up and we watched it and I was kind of like, you know, I actually like that one more than the recent ones because it was just, <laughs> I mean, the project was really rinky dink. That's stupid. Sure. Yeah. But it just, it was more gen, it's even more genuine that yeah. way. And Certainly, you know, I, I had a bit of an epiphany about that. Uh, I remember way back seeing about somebody made a Halloween costume that looked like he had a hole in his belly with like a screen on the front and the camera on the back. And I thought that was kind of cool. And then just recently I was flipping through Mark Rober's channels just to, you know, through history. It's like, oh, that was Mark Rober. And I'm like, wait, that, vi that Halloween costume wasn't built to be a cool Halloween costume. That was built for the video. Mm. because what Mark Rober does, he makes videos, you know, that mm. was built for them. And suddenly my perspective on that changed. I just watched something. I, I watched something that was built for me to watch as opposed to somebody did something cool and happened to make a video. So we all like this illusion that we're watching somebody who's doing stuff anyways, and just happened to make a video about that. And certainly I like to maintain that illusion to some extent. Uh, I wouldn't have built the crazy blower, obviously, if it wasn't about YouTube, although it was, it's fun to do that sort of thing. So it's good if a project has a justification. And so for instance, I wanted to build a bed, do the build a bed, because that topic does well. And so a friend was getting married and it's like, hey, you can need a bed for that room, right? They're like, I can, let me, I can build a bed for you. And I built a workbench for him too. So two things I built for a friend that I had no need for myself, just as a justification to build it because I mean, obviously I could make up something and lie and then afterwards just cut it back into scrap, scrap lumber. Um, but to have a reason to build this for a friend. So I have an honest backstory that isn't just, I'm doing this because I know this topic will do well. Um, and both of those things I built for him actually have, have been good evergreen videos that way. So it's important to have a backstory. So at least you maintain the illusion of, you know, what's your day job kind of thing. Yeah. Um, you're watching somebody doing yeah. stuff, not for the sake of, you know, it's like, it's much more interesting watching something about a real event. We all prefer, well, I shouldn't say we all, but it's like you prefer a documentary versus something that is made for TV kind of thing, where it's like, this is, this only happened because they wanted to film it. Right. You're exactly right. The authenticity is key. And that only comes if you yourself believe that you're doing this for the right reason. You said like either bought, like buying into the illusion or continuing the illusion. I find it, it makes it become less of trying to make it be an illusion. If I find reason behind why I'm making this video outside of just making this video, we, we come to it. We have a lot of people who are just like, why do you clean a bathroom? That's already clean. It's like, well, we're not going to mess up our bathroom to clean up the bathroom, to show you how to clean up a, you know, you can, so, you can get the same thing, whether the bathroom is dirty or clean. But uh, whenever we're talking, like we uh, only recently did a video about cleaning a non self cleaning oven, because we've never had a non self cleaning oven. And we never really wanted to do it, uh, 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 do a video where we went to someone else's house and cleaned it, because it just seemed like not authentic. And as much as we're, you know, polished and produced and all of the rest, in the background, something that's really, really important for us is still making sure that we're putting this video out and it it's at least authentic to us. We're not talking about something we don't do or we don't kind of whatever. And I think that's people know gone. that it's you get people who are getting into projects which aren't driven by them wanting to do it, further to your point. You're getting people who are gonna do the the river tables or the coffee table because that's just, you know, that's the most accessible thing. So you just lose that authenticity. You're only making, as you say, you're only making a video to make a video. This isn't a representation of, you know, where you're at or something that you actually want to say. Yeah, this is the kind of thing that I've been, you know, I've really I've been trying to wrangle for the past 10 years is how I want my videos to look and how I want to present them. And this year, more than any, I've changed the whole format. I just kind of ditched it all and just thought, I'm going to just try something different. Just because I think that there's so much of the, 
uh, watch me just build a project kind of video, you know, maybe spread, sped up action and a camera set up. And then it's just, it's, it's a real lean back experience. And so I thought, I, I don't know what else I can add to that. What else can I offer? How much more projects, what other project can I build that are going to be interesting to people other than the subscribers who just like to watch me build things. So by changing it to, I'm going to try to just show you what I'm doing in my shop on a day to day basis. The people who watch it really like it. They really like that format, the change of it. And I get a lot of comments. I get way more feedback about it, but it's a lot smaller audience. Yeah, I get yeah. way, way less but views than I used to maybe, get. It might be a much better funnel in terms of feeding into your uh, courses. It is. And that's exactly um, one of the benefits of it is I get a more genuine audience now by producing this kind of content. I, I, it's a kind of a thing where I have to kind of continually throw my ego out the window and know that I'm not going to get huge view count. Do you ever, do you ever leave a video, a comment? So one of the things I do is I leave comments on videos that I see in all sorts of different <laughs> channels. And then I'll get a notification when somebody replies to that comment. And it can be like two, three years later, I've totally forgotten that I ever left a comment on that video. But just last week, I got a reply to a comment I left on Gamer from Mars. He does these commentary channels on YouTube. And I left a comment a year ago, totally forgot about it, that I was really, it was really cool the way he pivoted his channel. He completely changed from a gaming channel to commentary on YouTube. And I thought that was a good thing to do. A year later, somebody replies to my comment and says, well, maybe you should try to pivot your channel since you have 1.6 million subscribers and you're only getting 50,000 views. <laughs> and I thought, oh man, that's just like, yeah, put the knife in the back and twist it. <laughs> oh. And so retroactively too, so late, so like years later, <laughs> what a great burn. <laughs> oh, speaking of it's like low. So Izzy Swan recently did a TED talk. Oh. So like, okay, well, you know, watch it. And it's like, it was relatively low view kind of like, might have done better since it's like it got up to maybe 4,000 views. It's like that's rather low. And then look at the channel that it's on, and the channel's got 23 million subscribers. It's like, oh, whoa. yeah, or something, something along the line of that ratio. Where it's again, it's one of those channels that has you're drinking from the fire hose. So the only people that subscribe to it are people <laughs> that don't follow your subscriptions, right? Yeah, yeah, I guess that's the difference between a channel that's producing content for subscribers and really trying to build it up, and the people channels who are just throwing a lot of content out there. But yeah. then again, I don't know. There's like T series. <laughs> I don't know. Well, it's yeah. easy when you upload a thousand videos a day. But why do people subscribe to that? Who wants yeah, that? That's... Well, it's like somebody hit a like button on there and they've subscribed to other things and they don't follow their subscriptions. Yeah. Maybe they were told to smash the like button and it's just like, I mean, it's an obligation at that point. If someone tells you to smash a like button, you have to. You know, I have to say, I've never, the only time I've alluded to that is I suggested that people should dislike a video. And? They didn't. <laughs> I was like, kind of like, this is not, you know, this is not on topic. So if you don't like it, just give it a thumbs down and go away. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> <how the> video <laughs> starts. <laughs> Isn't the most thumbed down video on the platform, Pootie Pie's video, trying to get the most thumbed down? Like he literally was like, hey, thumb that down this video. And try I thought it was a YouTube rewind. Yeah, I think. I think it Actually, very good point. You're right. That got like, bumped out uh, last year by last year's rewind. And it was a terrible one. I think that kind of killed the genre. And oh. Especially with COVID, they wouldn't have done it this year. Yeah, well, yeah. They, yeah, they 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 called it this year. That was so like, cringy. Oh, that was the worst rewind. Rewind used to be a, a thing. Everybody kind of liked to watch it and see who was going to be in there. And that was the that was horrible. That one. I remember yeah. Casey Neistat sort of apologizing for having been in it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. Like, what did we get ourselves? I don't watch into? him regularly, but uh, I think he it came up because he it was in the title about the rewind type of things. Like, oh, what does Casey have to say about the YouTube rewind? <laughs> because he was in it, and they they drag him out because he's one of the only dudes that'll like they the only real kind of like actual YouTuber that they put in. Everybody else is Will Smith and 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 you know oh, it was late horrible. night late night talk show host yeah, Jimmy I mean, Fallon on it like that's not YouTube that's what YouTube sort of, is now I get it that's the trending tab and that's part of YouTube but 
I always thought this pod that like th th this this platform was about the people that were incubated on it and like the people who yeah kind of, it's sort of like, where's Philip DeFranco and Foodie Pie and like these people yeah, who exactly. have it's, massive followings through the platform. It was reflective, I felt, of YouTube not wanting to be YouTube anymore because you know like this user generated content, there's just it's just too edgy. And, you know, what the average person thinks is not something that you want to have other, other people know that other people think about it, because what people think is not necessarily what uh, is the nicest or the most politically correct. You're right. There's the freedom to have the outside of the Hollywood glamour and the TV kind of uh, gloss on everything and it's real life. So you end up having Logan Paul's filming videos in Suicide Forests. And I get how YouTube doesn't want to promote that, even though they still, for some reason, continue to promote the Paul brothers. But that's... They, bring a lot, they bring a lot of money to the platform. No doubt. I saw an interesting sort of graph about, it was linked off of Hacker News, about the YouTube algorithm is toxic was sort of the topic, which I don't really agree with, but it's sort of like, it sort of showed a graph of, to the right was, you know, furthest to the right is like banned content. And then engagement, a graph of engagement, you know, it sort of grows up and then here's where you cut it off. You know, so you've got certain things that are, you know, like if you question the election, that sort of thing, that can become something that you get banned for. So people don't talk about that, but, you know, if we just barely don't, that has more engagement than necessarily something that is along the mainstream narrative. So, and, and there, there's a conflict of interest there because it's like, it's like a bar telling a bar that, you know, you should not let people get drunk. It's like, well, those are your best customers. <laughs> you know? The people that pay the bills. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's true. So, so there's a, a conflict of interest because on one hand, they want engagement. On the other hand, they want to sort of, keep it down to straight and narrow and not too controversial. Well, Matthias, I'm glad you could join us again on the podcast. We're looking forward to having you on here again and just mm. chit chatting. It was, it was cool to see where this conversation went. You have something else? Yeah, just one more correction on the last one. You said you're not on Patreon, blah, blah, blah. And that was combined with another question. Mm. So it's like, I should correct you on that. I actually am on Patreon. Oh, you are. I don't, I don't promote it much. I mentioned it in one video once and that gave it a, a nice boost. Um, so that was false. And I just meant to correct you on that one. Uh, like, I don't blame you for getting that wrong, but yeah. It's like, I don't want to be like holier than thou that I'm not. No, no, I've, I've actually. Uh, well, now you, you got to start plugging your Patreon. Yeah. You know, do you give people any like free extra content over there? I created one video that way and most of the feedback is you don't have to do that. We're just doing this to support you. Yeah. I kind of um, think that's a, that's kind of a lot of what Patreon is. It's people just want to support you over there. Yeah. But a lot of people are using it as, as a sort of a subscription service type of thing. Right. Enough, enough so that basically um, they're charging value added tax or whatever sales tax type of thing, because you know, a lot of Patreon support now is buying access, which means you need to charge tax for it. Right, right, right. Yeah. I mean, there's people making a lot of money with Patreon because they're willing to devote a lot of time and effort into it. Uh, Red Letter Media, it kills at, at uh, Patreon because they put a lot of behind the scenes content and they produce actual content specifically for Patreon. So yeah, yeah. Sorry. Okay. Sorry for cutting you off there, but yeah. As <laughs> I'm glad. <we're> ending things. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad. Well, I'm glad we got that straight. Everybody, go go subscribe to Matthias Wandel on Patreon. Support Matthias on Patreon. There you go. <laughs> or that one video they created on there. So for the one video. <laughs> right. go. And to support now I kind of, I now kind of want to see what that video is. You know, that's going to be the Oh same. yeah, well, you you have to give me a dollar. A one dollar. <laughs> pay the admission all right well it was great talking to you and for everybody listening thanks you thank you so much for listening and we'll see you next time